Today is our last day to be discussing Frege as a precursor to our important discussions of a more central figure in the history of analytic philosophy, which is Bertrand Russell. Russell may be the most important person in this history, but Frege is crucially important. So what we've done so far with Frege is look at three of his papers and also to see something of the new logic that he developed. So the crucial thing about it is he's doing both a new logic and a philosophy of language driven by the semantics for that logic. The idea is to come up with a better way of ensuring the kind of precision and analytical detail that's needed for evaluating abstract arguments, both in philosophy and in the foundations of mathematics. Frege's primary concern was with the latter, the foundations of mathematics. And in any case, where we ended when we were talking about these slides, the slides on Frege and the new logic, is Frege's logicism. The logicism in question is this. Arithmetical laws reduce to purely logical laws and to such laws alone. That's an ambitious research program, and it required Frege to develop a new logic. I'm going to show you a little bit of the details of the notation that Frege used. One thing this will do for you is make you thankful for standardization in notation, but it's also an interesting exercise to look at it and see what a person does in order to represent the logical relationships in question. So think about Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are very visual. You draw circles to represent groups of things. And if you're using them to evaluate syllogisms, the circles are S, P, and M, where S is the subject to the conclusion, P is the predicate to the conclusion, and M is the middle term that, in, that occurs in both of the premises. That's a very visual kind of thing. On the other hand, the notation that we usually use for standard first order theory isn't visual at all. The formulas are not visual, and when we give semantic clauses for these, they're written out in terms of some valuation function relative to a model where the model assigns a value of 1 or 0 to something if and only if every member of the domain call it D, every member of the domain D is assigned to the extension of the predicate letter F. Notice there's nothing visual, nothing pictorial about that. And similarly for all the other semantic clauses that we might do in a standard first order presentation of the kind of logic that's derived from Frege. This notation, this symbolism, is worlds different from what we find in Frege. So look at Frege's logic. First, in order to represent a statement, we have a little bar in front of it. To represent negation, we have something that looks like that. So this is a positive statement, that's a negative statement. Notice the kind of pictorial relationship we get to represent conditionality. We have a statement tied to some other statement connected by this symbol. And for generality, we get something closer to what we use in our symbols. So we have the predicate letter, we have the variable in question, and this is Frege's symbol for the universal quantifier. 
that's not as far from our standard notation now, but it's interesting to see visually representing conditionality in this way instead of as we standardly do it. We would write this. Frege writes it that way. Now, if you're a publisher, you're going to prefer our modern notation to these because creating that symbol is going to be a complicated matter, no matter what font you pick. And you're going to waste a lot of space on a page, top to bottom, by representing conditionals. Imagine embedding, say, five or six different conditionals inside of other ones. Pretty soon you're going to take up the entire page in order to represent something that could represent could be presented on a single line like this. That's a very complicated formula. It's got two, four, six sentence letters in it. So let's try to close all the parentheses. I think that's enough. It's got four open and four closed. So you can put that on one line of text. It probably takes up half the line if you're doing standard font sizes. But imagine what you'd have to do if you're going to represent it as Frege does with his conditional notation. Maybe you find this notation illuminating, but in any case, it certainly is not going to be attractive to printers. So it'd be nice to get past it. In any case, here's some more. Examples of propositional connectives. For Frege, just take simple sentences like, John is happy. Here we have the happy predicate, and J is a constant. We just do capital H lowercase j to represent John is happy. Frege's notation is not that far from that, except you have to have the little underscore line before the H. For negation, we typically use either a tilde or this other negation symbol. Frege would have us use this small t constant in front of the whole thing. Look then at a simple conditional. If the sun is shining, then John is happy. There you get Frege's notation. And here's our modern notation. Look at what you have to do to represent the sun is shining and John is happy. You represent conjunctions this way. Now, this, we represent conjunction this way, but remember, if we're trying to be as elegant as we can be in our formal system, we will introduce symbols only when we can define them in terms of prior symbols. By the time we get to Russell, the two fundamental symbols are going to be, well, for Russell, it's negation and wedge. But you can do it in terms of negation and any of these three so that you can define the other connectives that you want to introduce in terms of those two. When we get to Wittgenstein, we'll find out that Wittgenstein thinks you can be even more elegant using what are called Scheffer strokes, up and down. Um, one of these, we'll talk about this when we get to Wittgenstein, but a Schaeffer stroke represents not and or not or. And so it has both negation and or or and built into one symbol, and we'll show how that's supposed to work. But in any case, by the time we get down in Frege's system to representing conjunctions, what he's doing here is representing a conjunction in a way that's defined both by the conditional and negation. So if you're going to represent a conjunction, a conjunction can be represented as the negation of a conditional. Because a conditional, like 
a arrow b, the simplest way to represent it is not a or b. So you can define an arrow symbol in terms of these other two, which is what Russell's Principia Mathematica does. Well, what are you going to do to get a conjunction? How do you use wedges and ampersands to do a conjunction of A and B? Well, that's the negation of a disjunction, because the negation of a disjunction is a conjunction. And if you remember De Morgan's theorem, or remember a little bit from your early algebra days, wedges work like plus symbols in algebra. And ampersands work like multiplication symbols. So De Morgan's rules work both in algebra but also in logic. So A and B is the negation of not A or not B. In order for not A or not B to be true, one of the two has to be true. So for it to be false, they both have to be false. The falsity of not A is A, if you're willing to let me use double negation, and the falsity of not B is B, once again relying on double negation. So suppose you want to represent a conjunction in terms of a conditional. Well, you can replace that with its corresponding conditional. It will be not A arrow Sorry, that's wrong. It will be A arrow not B. So if we want a conjunction of A and B, that's going to be the negation of this conditional. In order for a conditional to be false, you need its antecedent to be true and its consequent to be false. So that's what this says. Notice this formula in our notation maps quite nicely on to Frege's notation. Because notice, you're going to have to have the negation of a certain conditional relationship. In Frege's case, the negation is repeated again a second time at the top of the conditionality relationship. Notice the consequent appears higher so that the downward slope of this symbol is a representation of the if relationship. This, if this. So you get too much getting in the way here you get it's false that not h if s, which is just what this symbol is doing. So the complexity of this way of representing a conjunction puts together the desire to be able to represent conjunction together with the desire to be able to define conjunction in terms of other connectives that are basic in the system. For Frege, what's basic in the system is negation and conditionality. So you start for Frege with this and this, and then once you get to and, you want to represent it in terms of the symbols that you've already got for negation and conditionality. You'll do the same thing with or. So the negation goes on the antecedent to the conditional, because remember the downward arrow is what's representing the if relationship. That mirrors what we do defining arrows in terms of the negation, either the falsity of the antecedent or the truth of the consequent for a conditional. And finally, it's interesting, Frege introduces a special unrelated symbol for if and only if. We typically use triple bars, or I prefer using arrows running both directions. But one of those two is what we use standardly in presentations of modern logic. 
Frege uses this identity symbol, which raises philosophical issues because now you're going to need a separate sort of identity relationship. Notice this is an identity relationship that holds between formulas, but when we get to on sense and reference, we have identity relations that hold between terms. This identity relation and this symbol can't be the same symbol. So that's an inelegance here. We're now going to be using the same symbol in two different ways, which means we're going to need to say something about it. Maybe what we do is we could use the short symbols like this, and then maybe the bars here will be longer. But that makes it really easy to misread what you're looking at. But it would prevent there from being ambiguity, where you have one symbol that gets used in two different ways. In any case, that's something about what Frege's notation looks like. And the crucial thing about it is this. That's what you're looking for when you're looking for negation. And this is what you're looking at when you're looking for the conditionality relationship. And it just represents the word if, the downward symbol. I don't even know. Maybe there is a standard term for what that symbol is called, but I don't know what it is. In any case, that's some visual presentations of Frege's notation. Here's what happens when we turn to quantifiers. For Frege, the universal quantifier is fundamental. Now remember the dual rule. For all x, fx can be rewritten as it's false that something is not f. That's the dual rule linking our two quantifiers. So Frege exploits that as well. He encodes the dual rule when he's representing the difference between everything is mortal and something is mortal. So we have the same predicate in both positions. Here's how we would represent it. And using the dual rule, something is mortal can be represented as it's false that everything is not mortal. So the dual rule gets exploited in modern logic using these symbols. Frege is relying on a dual rule here because this is the symbol for the universal quantifier, and notice it is preceded and succeeded by the Fregean symbol for negation. And the same thing carries through when we represent nothing is mortal. You're going to have one negation. Every person is mortal involves a conditional relationship between you're mortal if you're a person, together with the universal quantifier, and some person is mortal, asserts the negation. Remember, some person is mortal. We want a conjunction to appear. That turns out to be equivalent to the falsity of a universally quantified formula connecting personhood with lack of mortality. And that's what we're seeing in these symbols. Notice, in modern logic, you have two negations one that precedes the whole thing, and one that attaches to the consequent. That's what you have in Frege's notation as well. Finally, no person is mortal. Says for all x, if x is a person, then x isn't mortal. Or if you prefer exploiting the contradictory relationship between i and e propositions in categorical logic, it's false that there is some x such that x is a person and x is mortal. Frege just sticks with universal quantifiers throughout. And again, you have a universally quantified formula governing a conditional where there's a negation on the consequent, the mortality predicate. Our last melding of quantifiers and connectives has quantifiers over the double arrow and as before the double arrow is represented or 
triple bar is represented with the identity symbol and a universal quantifier. That's some of the details of Frege's logic. Now, what Russell said when he looked at the begriff shrift in this and the system that was developed there, he said he found it utterly mysterious until he thought through all of these matters on his own independently, and then he saw the brilliance of the Fregean system. We should not underestimate how significant this new logic Frege developed is. Prior to Frege, there were strands of insight into logic in Aristotelian syllogisms, but there was no unified, complete approach to logic in terms of both its syntax and its semantics that we could point to. And it's this enormous development, discovery, invention by Frege that's responsible for all sorts of things in the 20th century. Our understanding of logic was advanced enormously, at least the non-modal parts, the non-intentional parts of logic, came to be systematized through Frege's work. And this systematization, together with other developments in the early part of the 20th century, leads directly to the discovery, to the invention of computer technology and the like, because the fundamental insight Frege was pursuing was that reasoning doesn't require understanding or insight or anything else like that. It's just the following of formal rules. Writing down sequences of symbols on the basis of rules from other sequences of symbols. The rules merely encode relationships between the symbols, and so no insight or understanding of the language being spoken needs to be present in order to determine whether the inferences are correct instances of the rules of the system. As we've talked about before, Frege's logic is a second order one. We're going to be able to quantify both over the subject position and the predicate position. In modern second order logic, we'd represent the quantifying over predicate positions this way. I'm a bit uncomfortable with using precisely the same symbol for both of these quantifiers because they're both universal quantifiers, but they are in fact different quantifiers. Since we've talked about the second order character of Frege's system before, I won't say anything more about that now. What we do want to focus on, though, is the semantic apparatus that brought down the Fregean system on the basis of a letter from Bertrand Russell to Gottlob Frege in 1902, when the second volume of Frege's work was in press. So remember, Frege was born in 1848. I'd need to look this up, but there's about 25 years that separates. That separates the birth of Frege and the birth of Russell. So, and, and remember that there's also this interesting interplay between Germans and Brits. So there's an animosity present already between Germans and Brits. And then you've got a brash young Brit. Remember, this is about 1902. So the brash young Brit is in his late 20s, writing a letter to, uh, let's say, unkindly, a stodgy German who's 25 years his senior in his early 50s, who's been spending his life on this project. He spent three decades on this project. And so his first reaction to this letter from the brash Brit was not a very kind one. He didn't think much of it. He just thought the guy was being rude, but then he thought about it. So 
what, what, um, Russell's letter to Frege involved the following sentences. Sentence. Some barbers, so it's a barber sentence, shaves all and only those who do not shave themselves. Now the brashness comes out because you could have done this in formal mathematical logic where you talk about the set, the set S of all sets that are not members of themselves. Okay, so you could have done that. Frege probably would have been more receptive to that, but Russell thinks like a philosopher more than he thinks like a mathematician. And so he puts the set of all non-self-membered sets in the form of a counterexample in ordinary language. Now, what this example threatens is axiom five, the comprehension axiom in Frege's system. Frege refers to what we call the extension of a predicate in terms of courses of values. Now, for those of you who've had logic already, you know what the notion of an extension is. For those of you who haven't, the extension of a predicate letter is a set of objects. It's a set of objects in a model. A model is composed of an ordered pair consisting of a domain, which is a set of objects. Doesn't matter. There has to be at least one in there, but it doesn't matter how many there are. So domains could be trees in my backyard. Domains could be the set of natural numbers. Domains can be anything at all. When you change the domain, you have a different model. An extension function then assigns to each predicate letter a subset of the domain. So remember, the empty set is a subset of everything. So the extension of the predicate letter F could be the empty set. It could be just a, a strict subset of the domain, or it could be the entire thing. It doesn't matter. That's what extensions are. So extensions are sets of objects where the objects in question are the domain, are members of the domain that you're talking about for the model that you're looking at. Frege calls these extensions courses of values. He calls them that because he's thinking about variables like x, y, and z attached to predicate letters. So if you think about that formula, that open formula, it's got both a variable in it and a predicate letter, and then the variable can take a variety of values. And the particular variety of values that are attached to the predicate letter by your model is its course of values with respect to that model. Okay, so for each function or predicate letter f, there is an object which is the course of values of f. What is that object? Well, the set of things that satisfy the function in question. The course of values is a kind of recording of the value of the function for each argument for that function. Frege used a Greek epsilon with a smooth breathing mark above it to signify the course of values for a given function f. So where I was writing, the extension of f is a set of a certain sort. Frege notates that with the epsilon with the breathing mark above it. Just a minor variant on each other, but no difference in content attached to that where the first epsilon with the breathing mark is a variable binding operator and the basic principle governing identity of course of value or extensions is basic law five, which Frege writes this way, or which we might write this way. So the extension for a function f is the same as the extension 
for a function e if and only if all the same objects satisfy the two functions in question. It is this law that Russell exposes, thinking about the fact that some extensions are members of themselves and some aren't. We thus ask about the extension of the function or concept describing the set of all non-self-membered sets, and in doing so, we get a contradiction from this basic law. Now, we're going to look at the details of Russell's paradox in a moment, but you might wonder, how does a person come up with such a fancy counterexample? And the answer to that is Russell had been studying Cantor's work concerning infinity. And Cantor proves something that was initially not thought to be a proof, but a paradox, but he proves something. Cantor's proof is that the power set of a set has a larger cardinality than the original set. So just take a very simple example. Suppose you have a set, please pardon my awkward writing on my iPad. It's not exactly beautiful. Let me try again. That's not beautiful either, but you have a set composed of two things. Now remember, the power set of this set is the set of all subsets of it. So one subset of it is that. Another subset is that. But every set is a subset of itself. So notice we have at least three subsets when we look at the power set of a two-membered set. So the power set is strictly larger. So the cardinality of the set with which we started was two because it has two members. The cardinality of the power set is larger. And when you start looking at particular finite numbers of sets, Pick any number you want, and you can see a recipe for showing that the power set is going to be larger, strictly larger, than the set with which you started. We measure that in terms of the number of members of the set. But now suppose you get to infinity. Doing it with finite numbers is easy, because you can just attach some finite number to the size of the set you started with and the size of the power set that you end up with. And the second number will be larger than the first. But now, suppose we're talking about infinite sets. Think about some of the surprising things that you probably already know. The natural numbers and the odd numbers. Both of these have a cardinality that is infinite. In addition, think of the cardinality of prime numbers. Intuitively, there are less even numbers than natural numbers, and even less prime numbers than even numbers. And yet, there's a way of showing that the cardinality of these infinite sets is all the same. How do we do that? Well, that's what Cantor was working on. To show that two sets have the same cardinality, you show that there's a way of mapping between the elements of the sets in question that is both one and one to one and onto. What does that mean? All right, a mapping is onto, if and only if for every element in the second set, there's an element in the first set such that the function on that first element is the second. Equivalently, a mapping is onto just when its image equals its range. A mapping is one-to-one -one if the same sort of thing goes in the opposite, if we can go in the opposite direction as well. If each element in A maps to a different element in the range of B. 
more formally, for any a and b in a where a doesn't equal b, then its image won't be the same either. Alternatively, we could say that a mapping is one-to-one -one if and only if whenever the image of A equals the image of B, then A and B were the same. So here's how Cantor showed that some infinities have larger cardinalities than others. In particular, the power set of an infinite set will have a larger cardinality than the set that we started with. So let f be any function from a set to its power set. That's what this says. f is a function from s to the power set of s. We can then prove that no such function, no such function is a mapping of the first onto the second, and thus that there is a subset of s that is not in the image of the function in question i.e. not in fs, and thus that there's a member of the power set that is not assigned a value by any such function from the set to its power set. Okay, so we define something that takes us from a set s to its power set, and then we show that that's going to leave out something. There's a subset that won't be in the image of the function in question. So to, pr to prove this, define a subset of S as follows. Now here is where Russell's notion of the set of all non-self-membered sets starts showing up. Notice what this definition is. Subset T has a very peculiar character. It's the set of all elements of S that aren't in the image. That sounds very, very much like a set composed of all non-self-membered sets. That's the key intuitive idea. Now, by definition, T is a subset of S. Because notice, it picks out elements of S. And hence, it must be in the power set of S. But it is not in the image of S. It can't be, because look at the description. So there's an element in the power set, but no mapping of an element of the original set onto this element of the power set. Now, if you're interested, I want you to look at the proof, but I'm not so much interested in the precise proof as I am the analogy between this definition of T that Cantor relies on and what Russell sent to Frege that undermines Axiom 5. They both have this same non-self-membered character being appealed to. That, by the way, is part of the reason Cantor's proof was met with suspicion initially. People finally came to see, no, it really is a good proof. What it's a proof of is that there's an infinite hierarchy of larger and larger infinities that constitutes the land of the infinite. That's an amazing discovery. But in any case, you can look at this proof if you're interested in the details of Cantor's proof. I also have a more intuitive presentation in the next couple of pages of this slide or handout situation that I use when I teach this in class. So it starts with an intuitive presentation as I did writing before, where you start with this set, you list its subsets, and so you see that the power set is larger. And then you wonder if that fact is a perfectly general one. And the proof 
in a more ordinary language way can be set out as follows. Consider any arbitrary set S and its power set. So you've got S as the set we start with and P as its power set. Let's try to show first that S and P do not have the same cardinality. We do this by a reductio argument. So let's assume for reductio that S and P have the same cardinality. Then there's a one-to-one -one pairing between the members of S and P. Since P is a set of sets, every member of S will be paired with a set. The members of S don't have to be sets, but they all have to be paired with sets as long as there's this one-to-one -one pairing. Now suppose we ask a question of each member of S. Are you a member of the set with which you are paired? If the answer is yes, we'll say that that member of S is self-paired. If the answer is no, we will say that it is non-self-paired. So you can see how this connects with the set of all sets that aren't members of themselves just by those descriptions. Now consider the set of non-self-membered pairs of S. Call this new set N. N will be a subset of S by definition and hence will be a member of P because P is the set of all the subsets of S. So N will be one of the things paired with members of S since we're supposing that every member of P is paired with some member or other of S. Now let's think about the member of S which happens, which happens to be paired with N. Let's call the member paired with N Mr. X. Now let's ask, is Mr. X self-paired or non-self-paired? I.e., is Mr. X a member of the set with which he is paired or not. Suppose that Mr. X is self-paired, then he must be a member of the set N with which he's paired, but this can't be since N is the set of all non-self-paired members of S. So suppose instead that Mr. X is non-self-paired, then he must be a member of N since N is the set of all non-self-membered non-self-paired members of S. But then Mr. X is a member of the set with which he's paired, which makes him self-paired, which means that he can't be non-self-paired. So N is a member of the power set in question, but there can't be a member. This is the crucial thing. N is a member of the power set in question, but there can't be a member of the original set paired with it. That means that the cardinality of the power set is strictly greater than the cardinality of the original set, which is what Cantor's theorem states. Okay, so everything up until this paragraph is precisely what Russell used to attack Frege's axiom 5. Forget this part about omniscience. That turns out not to be, I mean, it is relevant to what we're talking about, but it takes us away from the Russell paradox. So notice until we get to this very last step where what we're after is the fact that no pairing can exist with respect to set N. That's just what goes on in Russell's paradox, except we don't have this last step about pairing. So Russell says, Consider this set S. You've got a whole bunch of sets. Some sets are members of themselves, let's suppose. The set of abstract entities is itself an abstract entity. So you, th you think, well, some sets or sets are members of themselves. Some sets aren't members of themselves. The set of concrete entities is not itself a member of itself because sets are not concrete entities. So you've got some sets that are members of themselves and some that aren't. 
So now consider this other set. It's a set of sets. It is the set of all sets S such that S isn't a member of itself. So what we're going to do is collect all these things together into a set. And now things blow up. So we ask ourselves, is this set a member of itself? The answer had better be no, because then it wouldn't satisfy the description given. So uh, the assumption that S star is a member of itself entails a contradiction. That's OK. That just tells us that S prime isn't, I mean, S star is not a member of itself. But holy shit, looks what, look at what happens then. It satisfies the description for being in S star. So it, if that's true, then it is a member of itself. Lesson, there can't be a set of all non-self-membered sets. This is a crucial, crucial paradox in the development of modern set theory. You have to figure out a way how to do set theory to avoid this catastrophe. Similarly, Frege's semantics faces the same problem because it is a set theoretic semantics. It assigns extensions or courses of values to each of the functions or concepts or predicate letters in the language. And it does so in a way that makes there be such a set for every well-formed, every predicate that's grammatically well-formed in the language. But not being a member of yourself for a set is grammatically well-formed. It just can't have a value. So Russell didn't just out of the blue wake up one afternoon, look at Frege, and find this fancy counterexample. It's not surprising that this isn't the way great intellectual discoveries typically work. The background of this is Frege, Frege proposes something, and Russell has been working independently in the foundations of mathematics and looking at the work of Cantor for about two years coming to appreciate Cantor's theorem and the proof for it. And then it's just one short step to where Frege's semantics gets undermined by the barber sentence. So the barber sentence is, there is a barber that shaves, who shaves, all and only those who do not shave themselves. Question, does the barber shave himself or not? Think about this very carefully, and you'll see that if the barber doesn't shave himself, then he does. And if he does shave himself, then he doesn't. Both of those inferences would be warranted. This is a catastrophe for Frege. Frege initially tried to respond to Russell's paradox by adding an addendum to the second volume of the work, the first volume of which was published a decade earlier. The problem is his addendum thought he could solve the problem. He said it's a very serious problem and it needed to be solved. It turned out his solution, though, implied that there is only one object. That's not a good result to have from your logic. Your logic should not be telling us how many things there are in the world. Maybe absolute idealists would love this thought, but that's not what logic is supposed to be doing. It's not supposed to inform us about the nature of the world. It's supposed to be in some way or another independent of that. So Frege thought he had a solution, but is quickly seen to be not, not any good at all. He spent the rest of his life trying to figure out how to solve this problem and ended up lamenting the fact that he didn't think it could be solved. He died in 1925, never having seen how to solve this problem.